Hi, good evening. Been a while since I've seen y'all. It is, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm Andy Panko, host of tonight's edition of Taxes and Retirement Live. Thank you all for joining me. I think it's been uh, it's been a few few weeks. I haven't even updated the the uh, the little thing that from the last time I did it was the first Wednesday of uh, of April when I did the mailbag edition. Too lazy to change it. I wasn't here the second week. That was Cody. I wasn't here last week because I was away. This week I'm back, uh, and then uh, next week will be another mailbag. So there you have it. Anyway, thank you all as always for joining. Tonight's topic is going to be how to give to charities as tax efficiently as possible. Um, spoiler alert, I've, I've gone through this exact same bit a couple times over the last few years. Um, but for those of you who are new or have different questions, and I did update the facts and figures, uh, hopefully this will be new to some of you and, you know, uh, educational to some of you, or if nothing else, a refresher to those of you who have seen this, this spiel before and are uh, watching again. So regardless, thank you for being here. Thank you for watching. Um, okay. Dad jokes for the evening. Got some good ones for you. Somebody should market a beer called occasionally. So when asked, I can say, I only drink occasionally. I usually only drink, not only, but Miller Lite's my go-to uh, if anyone cares or is interested. Um, Dos Equis or Corona. If I'm feeling a little kind of Mexican flair, I like Stella, Stella Artois or Artois as uh, the non, non-francophiles would say. Um, that one's got some punch though for for a light beer. I, I do not like hearty, hoppy, heavy beers. I like mine uh, kind of watery, four to six percent alcohol uh, content. Again, not that I expect you to buy me a beer, but if you do ever see me, you be like, "Hey, let me get you a beer." There you have it: Miller Lite, Dos Equis, Corona, uh, Stella. If I want something a little soupy, maybe a Heineken. Anyway, moving on. Never anything dark or golden. Um, Gives me like immediate headache. Maybe I'm just weak. Sorry, where was I? Next question. Uh, next uh, dad joke. Um, my, co- <laughs> my cousin was hospitalized after shoving 28 small plastic horses in his rectum. Stick with me here. Doctors describe his condition as stable. Get it? Rectum nearly killed him. Uh, and finally, I bought it. Hold on. I forgot. Let me get my guy. I actually should have closed with that last, uh, the horse's stable rectum joke. Uh, anyway, final joke for tonight. I bought a dog off a of blacksmith today, and as soon as I got it home, it made a bolt for the door. <laughs> because blacksmiths make things out of metal, like bolts for doors. Get it? it? Took me a while to get it. Once I got it, I was like, hey, that's pretty good. Okay, uh, before we do it, the disclaimer, this video is only general explanations and education. It is not specific tax, legal, or investment advice. Before considering acting on anything you see in this video, first consult with your tax, legal, or investment advisor, which I am not, even if I am the advisor to some of you watching uh, tonight, is just general explanations and education. It is not specific advice to uh, any of you all. Cool, let me see if comments are working. Indeed they are. Ciao, says David Fultz. Bonjour, bonsoir. Um, stay thirsty, my friend. Always do. Always stay thirsty. Uh, Dos Equis is a good one. Yeah. I'm not the most interesting man in the world, but I do like Dos Equis. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, let me get that comment off. So tonight I got some slides for you. Feel free to jump in with questions. We'll, we'll see where this goes. Shouldn't be too long, but I'm plenty happy to stick around for the hour, for an hour and uh, field whatever questions you all may have. Just first I ask to ask questions about, you know, the, tonight's content as opposed to IBON questions or other random questions sprinkled in. So let me get the slides pulled up. Let me do this. Let me just change this, get this. Okay, here we have it. Um, share screen, slides, share screen, got it. Okay, so charitable donations. Now, I assume most of you know donations you make to qualified charities are potentially deductible on your tax return, meaning they can help reduce the amount of income on which you have to pay taxes. Uh, another, not to get too off the rails here about uh, tax return education, but w- the, the the things you can deduct on your tax return fall into one of two categories or types of deductions. There's the standard deduction, which everyone's allowed to take just simply for being. And because you're alive, you can take the standard deduction, uh, which is a certain amount. You have your gross income from which you subtract your standard deduction. 
The remainder is your taxable income. That's the amount on which you actually pay tax. Now, there's more to it than that, but let's, let's leave it there for now. Or you can what's called itemized deductions, where there's a handful of different uh, expenses or things you can add up. And if the sum of those things is larger than the standard deduction, then you would take the itemized deductions to reduce your gross income, where the result, again, is a taxable income on, on which you actually pay taxes. So the, there's a handful of things that are currently uh, able to be itemized uh, for itemized deductions. One is medical expenses, but only if they exceed 7.5% of your gross income, adjusted gross income. Um, charitable donations, subject to re some restrictions, and that's what we're going over tonight. Mortgage interest, specifically only, well, generally, if it's only interest um, uh, for a loan that's, that's uh, for your primary residence. State and local taxes, so real estate taxes, uh, you know, property taxes, um, state income taxes, state um, personal property tax. Some states charge, um, you know, tax on cars based on the value of the car. That's potentially deductible. But all those things collectively have to be capped at ten thousand bucks in terms of how much you can potentially itemize. Uh, um, I feel like I'm forgetting another one. There's got, there's like four big ones. I'm drawing a blank. Um, medical, charitable donations. More, I guess not. Mortgage interest. Yeah, and then, and then uh, state and local taxes. There's also some smaller ones. Um, uh, I think unreimbursed property damage. Like if you live in a federally declared disaster area, your house gets destroyed and the value of your loss exceeds what's reimbursed by insurance, you can deduct the, uh, you know, some of that, that excess. But anyway, so unless your itemized deductions exceed your standard deduction, you don't get any direct benefit for your itemized deductions. Uh, so charitable donations, part of your itemized deductions, if you're not donating a lot and your total itemized deductions don't exceed your standard deduction, you get zero direct uh, tax benefit for making that charitable deduction. Now, stepping back, broader comment, you should be making charitable donations because you're, you're genuinely charitably inclined. Don't make a charitable donation simply for the sake of trying to save taxes or, or trying to be better off financially. Because best case, the donation you make is going to save you, let's assume you're in a 30% tax bracket, just you know, tax range, making up a number. You donate a dollar, you're going to save 30 cents in taxes. You're still out 70 cents, right? So don't do charitable donations, just try to save taxes. Uh, if you are doing charitable donations because you're charitably inclined, then pay attention to the tax impacts of it because you can potentially do things where everybody wins. The charity gets money and you get to get some tax benefit for it. That's the purpose of tonight's thing. So anyway, for those that don't know, for the tax year 2022, here are the standard deductions. If you're if you're single, it's twelve thousand nine hundred fifty bucks. If you're married, filing joint return, it's simply double that twenty five thousand nine hundred dollars. Or if you're uh, a, a filing status called head of household, it's nineteen thousand four hundred. Additionally, if you're sixty five or older, as of December thirty first, twenty twenty two, there's an additional uh, extra amount of standard deduction. If you're married, file a joint return, you'd add fourteen hundred bucks. For each of the spouses that's 65 or older or if you're single or head of household you'd add 1750 to your standard deduction and it's not just if you're 65 or older it's also if you're blind um you, you also get another deduction so for example if you're 66 and blind and you're single let's say you would add 1750 twice on top of your standard no, i say it out loud doesn't sound right. i'm pretty sure that's right i could be I'm second guess myself for some reason, but I do think you can double up these extra amounts. If you're 65 and blind, you would get these these double uh, these extra amounts twice. So that's standard deductions, just so you know. So, um, you know, if you're only going to donate a thousand bucks, even if you have the full ten thousand dollars state and local tax deduction and some mortgage interest, you may not hit uh, an itemized deduction amount that's large enough to exceed the standard deduction. So, you're not going to get any direct tax benefit for your um, for your donation. All right, so that's important to know, standard deductions. Next, if and when you do make charitable donations, there are limits to how much you can deduct. Even if you, your itemized deduction is larger than your standard deduction, you have to keep these limits in mind. So I'm summing it, that, summing it up a lot. There's, um, there's more granularity than this, but this covers the, the majority of things that, that people would potentially donate. And again, this is all just a qualified charities. If you're giving money to a family member because he or she's poor or about to be bankrupt, or you walk down the street and see, you know, someone hard up on their luck uh, asking for money or food, and you give that person twenty thousand bucks, 
I mean, good for you. You're, you're a good soul, but that is not a donation, not a charitable donation in the eyes of the IRS. And therefore it's not deductible. Okay. It's a gift. It's simply a gift. It's not a donation. It is gifts are not deductible. So keep that in mind. Um, not to prevent you from giving money to people who need it, but just know you can't deduct it unless the money's going to a qualified charity. So that's the assumption for tonight. Everything you're donating is to a qualified charity, not a gift. Um, okay. So here's the main types of, of assets or things that, that could be donated. First is cash, pretty straightforward, actual cash, physical bills, or if you write a check to a, to a charity or make a credit card donation or a direct bank transfer, that's all considered cash. The amount that you can deduct in any given year is capped at 60% of your adjusted gross income for 2022. For the last couple of years, it was actually 100%. Those, those were temporary um, pandemic relief initiatives to, uh, to help spur giving to charities that needed it. Now that 100% thing went away, starting back in 2022 going forward. If you donate cash, the most you can deduct in one year is 60% of your adjusted gross income. Capital gain asset, what is this? It, that, that's informal IRS speak, a capital gain asset. is something where uh, it's an investment, like a security, a stock, a bond, a mutual fund, where there is a capital gain, uh, meaning that the price at which you bought it is lower than the price that it currently is. And it's a long-term capital gain, meaning you've held it more than a year. Now, here's where things get a little tricky. Um, there's two different ways or two different limits you, you have to keep in mind in terms of how much you can deduct in a given year. If you are deducting the asset at its fair market value, so its current price, you know the price as of the day you donate it, you can only deduct 30% of the value of that donated security in the current year. Now, hold that thought. You may be asking what happens to the rest of it. Well, you can carry it over. Well, no, not hold that thought. Let's do it now. Um, if you do get capped out by one of these deductibility limits and you can only deduct so much this year, you can carry over the remainder of the non-deducted donation for the, for the next five years. And you can deduct it in those years if you don't cap yourself out again You know, for that year's gross income limit. So there may be some planning, depending how much you donate and you kind of have to project out your gross income the next few years, you ideally want to try to be able to get the full deductibility of this stuff. So pay attention to these limits and the fact that you can only carry over um, non-deductible donations for five years after the year of the donation. So anyway, capital gain asset. If you are deducting the current value of the security, you can only deduct 30, you know, deduct it up to 30% of your adjusted gross income. Or... If you're deducting it at the cost, the price you originally paid, not its current value, you can deduct the cost value up to 50% of your adjusted gross income. So this one's kind of a mind bender at first. You may be thinking, well, why would I do one over the other? It really depends on the security and where it's, um, you know, how much gain it has. So for example, if you bought something at a hundred bucks uh, five years ago, a, a stock, and it's now trading at $101, the gain is minimal. The gain's one dollar. So you have two options. You can deduct it at its fair market value, which is one hundred and one dollars. In which case, you'd only be able to deduct, you know, at most. Um, uh, well, no, I shouldn't say at most. But it, this is where you need to know your AGI. The point is, the dollar amount of deduction you can take will be larger if you deduct this particular security at fifty percent of its cost, which was one hundred dollars, as opposed to thirty percent of its current value which is $101. Um, so this is really situational. Again, depending what you donated, how much the gain is, that's going to dictate what's better for you to deduct it at cost or fair market value. Uh, the next type of, of, of asset is ordinary income asset. This is similarly an investment, a security, a stock, a bond, a mutual fund, whatever, but where it's a short-term gain. So you've held it 12 months or less. This is fairly straightforward. You can only deduct that cost. Specifically, you can deduct 50% or you can deduct it up to 50% of your uh, uh, adjusted gross income. And finally, all other property, I have some examples here, clothes, furnishings, automobiles, uh, investments that are worth less than you paid. So the, the prior to capital gain asset and ordinary income asset, those are things where the, the price of security is more than what you paid. If the price is less than what you pay, it's considered other property in this fourth category. Um, and there's more, you know, th these are, you know, tangible things, whatever, art, who knows, collectibles. Um, there are other 
limits within this. For the most part, you can deduct these things at their fair market values up to 50% of your adjusted gross income, but with some restrictions. Like cars, for example, um, when you donate a car, you may see those those billboards and the, you know the catchy jingle on the radio, one one eight 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 cars for kids or one eight hundred cars for kids or whatever it is, something cars for kids. Um, donate your car to apparently help kids in some way. I, I don't know, whatever, because kids can't drive, I guess. Oh, so anyway, so you donate the car and they immediately sell it. So what happens is when you donate a car, um, you, you can only deduct the fair market value up to 50% of AGI or the price at which they sell it. So charities usually turn around and sell your car. Uh, if they sell it for, let me see if I have this right. If they sell it for less than the fair market value, you can only deduct the price at which they sold it. So you donate a car, you know, it's values 10 grand, according to Kelly Blue Book or something. You donate it to 1-800-CARS-FOR-KIDS and they sell it for 10, uh, I'm sorry, for eight grand. You can only deduct up to eight thousand dollars of that donation, not the ten thousand fair market value. So that's one example where it kind of depends uh, what you can deduct. And there's other ones, collectibles. I think have some sort of other funky limit to it, but uh, I'll leave it there. Uh, I forget the IRS publication that details this stuff out, but just just Google and research. The IRS has a lot of good info about these deductibility limits for these different kind of off the beaten path assets. Um, okay, next. So that's deductibility limits. Now, how do these things actually work? What if you're donating different types of assets? You know, some like cash, you can deduct up to 60% of AGI and you donate some appreciated securities where you can only don't, you can only deduct them up to 30% of AGI example, you know, for example. So let, let's look at an example here. So hypothetical, someone has a hundred thousand dollars of adjusted gross income. This dotted line is where the 60% uh, limit is. So let's assume they're just donating cash this year and they donate $70,000 in cash to a charity or a donor advised fund, for example. I'll talk about those more in a second. Um, because their adjusted gross income for the year is $100,000 and they're donating cash, cash is a 60% deductibility item. So you can only deduct $60,000 of the $70,000 you donated because you can only deduct up to 60% of your adjusted gross income. Make sense? So this green amount is what you can actually deduct. You can you can deduct sixty thousand dollars this year out of your seventy thousand dollar donation, and the remaining ten thousand dollars that you cannot deduct this year will carry over till next year, and you apply that as a deductibility for next year's uh, charitable donation. So you don't lose it; you can carry it over for five years. If you can't use it up within the subsequent five years, then the deductibility is lost and gone forever. You know, can't get it back. So plan accordingly. Um, question I see. So this is in reference to the, uh, to donating cars. I assume I, I forget the mechanic. I've never donated a car myself. I looked this up at one point and I forget the mechanics of it, but the charity is obli uh, obligated or you have to ask them if they don't send it to you. Basically it's ultimately on you to find out what do they sell it for? Now I think charities will typically notify you. I think there's some formal form, some reporting form where they'll tell you, we sold the car. Here's for how much. If they don't, make sure you find out. You know, it's on you to to get that information from them. But I think they should they they should tell you. So if and when you ever do donate a car, be sure to ask that before you donate it. Hey, are you going to sell it? And if so, how and when am I going to be notified of how much you sold it for? Because you're going to need that info to do your tax return. Great question. Um, okay. So this was the uh, donating seventy grand of cash. Let's look at another example. What if you are donating different types of assets, again, which have different uh, deductibility limits? For example, assume you're donating some appreciated securities that are highly appreciated, where you're going to want to try to donate them but uh, at their fair market values. But that means you're capped at deducting only 30%, up to 30% of your adjusted gross income. Separately, you're donating a bunch of clothes and other random stuff that's deductible at 50% of AGI. And you're donating some cash where that cash, as we saw before, is deductible up to 60% of your AGI. But what happens is when you donate things of these different deductibility levels, the ones that have the highest uh, deductibility amounts of so cash will come first. So any cash don donations you make first get layered onto this graph this little schematic here. So let's assume you donate 40 grand in cash this year. And again, assume you have $100,000 of AGI. 
So first you use your 40 grand to stack into this, this, this pipe, this vertical pipeline here. And look, boom, 40 grand of cash already exceeds 30% of AGI. So this now completely crowds out the ability to take any deduction for any of those appreciated securities that you want to donate at fair market value. Because again, those are limited at 30% AGI. You already crowded that out with cash. So those are done. So you're not deducting any of your appreciated securities at fair market value this year because 30% is already filled and then some. So you donate 40 grand in cash. Cool, you can, you can deduct all 40 grand of that because cash you can deduct up to 60% of AGI. Now you also donate some other securities, other capital gain assets. Like I said, you, you cannot deduct them at fair market value because you already crowded out that 30%, but you can still potentially deduct them at their cost. Because when you're deducting at cost, you can deduct up to 50% of AGI as I showed in the other graph. So you can still potentially deduct up to 10 grand more of those security donations uh, here. And if you were to also donate um, clothes and other random stuff, like I said, well, that would be crowded out because you already used up your 50% of AGI. So now you can't also get deductions for clothes, home furnishing, cars, because those were capped at 50% of AGI. Make sense, hopefully. In reality, I don't think most people hit these things unless your AGI is really low. Um, I have, um, I've worked with someone where this is the case, not because AGI is really low, because it's we're intentionally trying to keep it fairly low for, for tax management purposes and also make a large donation, made a large donor advised fund donation this year where it took a lot of math and circular um, analysis to figure out what's the right amount to donate, knowing that the donation is going to be capped at 30% of AGI this year. So there will be carryover. We're trying to make sure we don't lose that carryover over the next five years. So we backed into kind of how much to donate to, uh, to hit where we're trying to hit. It was an interesting exercise. Anyway, so now let's get into, um, Teresa Wood asks for 2020, were the limits changed from 30% to 50 or 60 for appreciated securities? Uh, good question. I, I don't know. Now that you say that, they may have been. Or maybe the fact that you said that is making me think that was the case, but it wasn't. I, I really don't know. I, I wouldn't doubt it if they were. I, I, I don't know for certain that they were or weren't, but it would make sense that they were in the same vein of why cash donations were, were jacked up to be able to uh, to deduct at 100% of AGI. This would make sense, uh, Teresa, but but I don't know for sure. Regardless, water under the bridge at this point, um, unless you haven't done your 2020 return yet for some reason, in which case this would still matter. But otherwise, for 2022, no, definitely it's, you know, they're, they're not increased. Good question. Okay, so I have four um, strategies, if you will, for, for maximizing the ta tax efficiency of donations. There's a fifth, maybe even more. They're a little fancy and, and kind of bit complicated in the next level and beyond the scope of what most people will need to potentially consider. There's something called a charitable remainder trust. Uh, man, I forget the specifics of these, but basically you donate money to a trust and the beneficiaries of the trust can use the money while in life. And then when they die, the remainder goes to a charity, hence charitable remainder trust. Um, I know enough to be dangerous. I actually don't even know that much. I did know these fairly well at one point when I had to study for the CFP, basically. But beyond that, I haven't really dug much into them. There's, there's not, uh, in most cases, they're, they're not really necessary. If you have substantial wealth and have lots of legacy goals, th then sure, they can come into play there. Um, but for the vast majority of people, I, I think it's kind of overkill. These these four strategies here are probably, uh, not probably, but very likely more than sufficient. So one is bunching donations. So keep in mind, I'm assuming, um, I'm assuming this is a married couple. Keep in mind what I said initially in that first slide, the standard deduction. Unless your itemized deductions exceed your standard deduction, you get no direct tax benefit for the donations you make or any of your other itemized deductions for that matter. Here's the example, 2022. Here on the right, the standard deduction is $25,900 for a married couple. I'm assuming they're both under 65 and neither are blind. So there's no top up to uh, the standard deduction. And here's our hypothetical um, itemized deductions. They, they're hitting the cap of $10,000 in state and local taxes. Here in New Jersey, for example, you can easily exceed $10,000 just in property taxes alone, uh, let alone state income tax on top of it. So High tax states, people very commonly hit this $10,000 cap on state and local taxes. So they have that 10 grand. Add to that 7,000 bucks for the year in uh, mortgage interest. 
and assume they make $5,000 in donations every year, including this year. So add these three things up. They have $22,000 of total itemized deductions. But that's less than the 25,900 of standard deduction. So completely forget all these itemized deductions. They get zero direct tax benefit because they're already getting sort of a freebie. I don't say freebie, nothing's free with the government, but um, um, you know, an automatic $25,900 deduction just for showing up, you know, just for doing their return. They didn't need to do anything special to get it. So this is an example where you're not really efficiently giving your money because the 5,000 you give every year to charity, you're getting no direct tax benefit for. So you can, you can uh, potentially bunch your donations. Here now is the same scenario, except instead of donating 5,000 every year, you donate 5,000 every three years. So here's what this would look like on the years where you are making that bunched, uh, tripled up donation. You'd still have the $10,000 state and local tax that you're hitting, you know, itemized deduction. You'd still have your $7,000 mortgage interest or whatever it is in that year. And instead of 15,000 donation every year, you're doing 15,000 every three years. So now add these three up and your itemized deduction is $32,000, which exceeds the $25,900 standard deduction. So now in the years you do these bunch donations, you're better off by, uh, what's the math here? $6,100. Uh, you, you'll have $6,100 less of taxable income. If you're in, let's keep the math, uh, easy, 33-ish you know, percent effective tax rate, that means you're saving about two grand in taxes this year. Now, the other years where you're not doing the bunching, you're no worse off because you, you, you'd still be taking the standard deduction anyway. But by bunching, you're at least in every three years, you're getting yourself that much more of a tax savings. In my example, you know, a couple thousand bucks of tax savings for bunching these. So that's good. Now, the upside is you're still donating 15 grand every three years to the charity as opposed to five grand every one year, um, and you're getting a tax benefit for it. The potential downside is really uh, to the charity. If the charity is lean and mean and really relies on all, you know, every single dollar it can get every year of donations to meet its, you know, its uh, operating expenses and, and, and charitable endeavors for the year, then maybe they're gonna be harmed by waiting every three years to get this fat lump sum. Maybe for them, they'd rather get the money every year. So that's one thing you have to keep in mind. I don't I don't know of any, I mean, I'm sure there are, but I don't know of a lot of charities, especially the bigger ones that are gonna be that hard up by getting money every three years uh, instead of you know smaller amounts every year. But nonetheless, it's, it's something to keep in mind. So um, next, donor advised funds. And this is one of the ways where you can still bunch donations and overcome what I just mentioned, where the charity has to wait every three years to get money from you. You can still bunch donations, get the tax benefit of that, just like in this slide. And you can still dole out or have the money doled out to the charity in, in littler amounts every year by way of using a donor advised fund. You'll uh, commonly see these referred to as the acronym DAF or DAF. So if you ever see that in the group, now you know what it means, donor advised fund. Um, just looking at this, hold on. Someone posted about charitable remainder trust with a charitable remainder trust. The beneficiary takes annual distributions, crats and crusts and for charitable remainder, uh, accumulate annuity trust, charitable remainder unified uh, man. I forget. These are all things I knew at one point, um, according to a schedule locked in when it's in place. So those distributions may include principal income, capital gains, which are to distribution. The remainder goes to the charity. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Whoever this was. Um, what's this? The deductible amount is based on how much is expected per formula to be left to the chat. Right. So this is again, in regards to charitable remainder trust, um, there, there's more math and function to it than this. It's not just simply put money in a trust, take money out as you please for the trust beneficiaries. No, that there's some formula, some restrictions to it. Um, the remainder that's left goes to the charity, but you, you can't just free will and, you know, give as much as you want to your, to your heirs. That, that would be, uh, highly frowned upon by the IRS. So anyway, back to donor advised fund. So what is this? Um, a donor advised fund is an entity. On the surface, it looks like an account, an investment account. You put money in, while the money's in there, it can be invested in, depending on the donor advised fund platform, potentially any stock, bond, mutual fund, whatever, just like an IRA, just like a regular brokerage account can. Now there's probably going to be more restrictions than, than you know normal IRAs. But for the most part, just think of it like an investment account. You put money in, the money in there can be invested. Um, and then over time, 
you would um, call up or send an email or go online to the donor advice on platform and say, hey, of the money in the account, please send out whatever, a hundred bucks to you know St. Jude's this month. And six months later, you call up, say, hey, send out 500 bucks to uh, American Red Cross. Next year, you call up, say, hey, send out a thousand bucks to American Cancer Society, you know, whatever. Um, and, and they'll do that. Now, here's, here's the technical aspects of it. A donor advised fund, while functionally looks and feels like an investment account, it is technically its own qualified charity, in, um, qualified charitable organization. When you donate money into it, well, when you put money into it, you're technically donating money into it. Again, because the fund is its own charity, you get a donation, uh, I'm sorry, you get a deduction at the time you put the money into the fund because that uh, contribution is technically a donation. So here you go. So the money you put in is deductible just as if you gave cash to a charity you know, outright. Um, once the money's in the fund, you cannot get it back. It is not yours. You, you irrevocably gave it to this charity. While it may sort of look and feel like it's yours because you have access, you'll, you'll probably have access to view this fund, this account through some statement, through some online platform. Maybe your advisor even manages it for you and you can see this fund on that advisor's platform along with your other accounts, brokerage account, IRA, Roth IRA, whatever. It may look and feel like it's yours, but it is not yours. Once you make that donation, done. You know, it's functionally the same as you having made a donation straight away to St. Jude's. It's not yours. You can't ask them for that money back. I mean, you can. They'll probably they'll say no. Um, it's gone, right? Even though you have some control over how it's managed and invested, it, it's gone. It's not yours. It's technically the charity's money, where again, the fund is a charity. They can ultimately do with it as they please, um, which is something else to keep in mind. You, the way these work is you generally have the discretion. Once you put money in, you generally have the discretion to uh or at least some discretion on how it's how it's advised how it's managed and you usually have a lot of discretion with regards to how and when the money is done or or where and when the money is donated to the end charities in my example before 500 to saint jude's a thousand to american red cross a thousand to american cancer society whatever uh local churches because you don't you don't actually own and control the fund the, the donor advised fund platform or administrator does, they can say no to any and all of your requests. Now, practically speaking, chances are they won't, you know, if, if they were to anger their donors by not, um, not obliging the donors wishes with how the money's to be donated, they're going to lose business. So uh, practically it doesn't happen a lot, but if, just keep in mind that it can, especially if it's a, donor advised fund sponsor a platform that is like uh social or morals or religious based they they can and likely will deny donations to charities they don't approve of such as those that support uh, i don't know if there are i assume they are i don't know like like pagans you know pagan causes or something or um charities that support um you know uh planned parenthood or or to be blunt you know abortion um, chances are like a Christian based donor advised fund platform will not honor your request to donate money to some uh, charity that, that, that does or sponsors or, or supports abortions. So just keep that in mind. Um, you need to have, you need to think through who you plan on ultimately or who you're going to want this money to ultimately go to, and then find a donor advised fund platform that will most likely hopefully honor those requests when the time does come for you to, uh, to, uh, you know, make those requests. So just to circle back, um, how, how do these get around the bunching thing where the charity uh, years without getting money? Well, you can still bunch and bunch up one big fat donation to the donor advised fund, you know, on day one. And then, you know, maybe once again, every five or 10 years when the money's in the fund, you can, like I said, call up and say, Hey, send out 500 bucks this year to the charity, send out 500 next year to the charity, send out 500 next year to the charity. So you, you can parse out with, uh, you know, with regular intervals, the uh, the money to the charities, so that's the charities can still get the benefit of that money on a on a recurring basis, as opposed to having to wait for it in one big fat lump sum every two years. So that's a donor advised fund. Um, let's keep in mind th these aren't free. The going rate for donor advised funds, even the, the large sort of low cost platforms like Fidelity, Schwab, Vanguard, they all have donor advised fund platforms. They all charge zero point six percent per year of the assets in the fund subject to minimums. And last I checked, you need to have like 50 to 80 grand in there 
so that the minimum charge isn't more than 0.6% of the assets. So donor advised funds aren't something you put, you know, thousand bucks into. These are like tens of thousands of dollars is what, or, or more. Um, you know, that's what it's larger donations. So again, 0.6% typically, or that's the minimum. Some are even higher. And if you're working with an advisor where the advisor manages the fund for you, he or she may also um, add their fee or maybe not their whole fee. You know, most advisors charge 1% of assets. Hopefully they won't charge their full 1% of assets on top of the 0.6% charged by the donor advised fund platform. That's a lot of fees. But um, you just keep in mind, these things aren't free. There are fees to open them. And then if your advisor manages it, assume there'll be some fee for the, for the advisor as well on top of the donor advised fund platform fee. Alrighty, um, Dave Myers, yes, donor advised funds don't even have to follow your wishes for distribution. Never heard of one that doesn't, but keep in mind they do not have to because it's not your money. Dave Myers also says some donor advised funds have other restrictions. A certain university I know sponsors one every dollar you put in, you get to direct 50 cents to a charity and 50 cents goes to the university. Fair enough. So definitely read the details. Um, that one has a million dollar minimum. Yeah. Okay. But the ones that like Fidelity, Schwab, Vanguard, I don't know that they have a formal minimum, but they in effect do because the minimum fee they charge you is going to be cost prohibitive. You're only putting in 50 bucks or a thousand bucks. So they kind of force your hand to put it in some minimum. All right. That's donor advised funds. Moving on to, to topic three, qualified charitable distributions only applies to people who are 70 and a half or older. If you're not, you can kind of tune out, go, go get a donut or something now, take a break. Um, if you're 70 and a half or older, you can donate money directly out of your IRA, including an, a SEP or simple IRA or an inherited IRA to a qualified charitable organization. In addition to having to be seven and a half years old, like I said, um, you're capped at being able to donate no more than $100,000 per person per year. So in the case of a married couple, you can each donate 100,000. So that's 200 grand per couple. The real magic of... of um, uh, qualified charitable distributions. And I'm going to go so far as to say, if you are over 70 and a half and you plan on donating cash to any charity, do it by way of a, of a qualified charitable uh, distribution, assuming you have an IRA. If you don't, then not issue. But if you do, you should do it through a qualified charitable distribution. You should not do it just by writing a check out of your bank account. Here's why. Because the distributions you, you take out of your IRA that are part of a qualified charitable distribution do not show up in your gross income at all. They simply leave your IRA, go right to the charity, done. Now there's a little bit of uh, work and labeling you have to do in your tax return to denote that distribution as a qualified charitable distribution. So definitely keep in mind, if you do do these, take good notes so you remember that you made this distribution because when you get your 1099, 1099R at the end of the year, it will have nothing special on it saying it was a qualified charitable distribution. It'll look like a normal distribution. It's on you to know and remember it was a QCD, so you can denote it accordingly in your tax return. But the magic is it, it, it doesn't even hit your adjusted gross income at all. Furthermore, it can take the place of your required minimum distributions, which start in the year you're 72. Um, so if you are that year or older and you don't need the money from your required minimum distributions and you're terribly inclined, you can kill two birds at one stone. You can make QCDs. They will dollar for dollar reduce or completely erase your required minimum distribution for the year. So now, so so what? What's just stepping back? What's the magic of these things not hitting adjusted gross income? You may be saying, well, if I donate a thousand dollars cash or ten whatever ten thousand dollars cash on my bank account, I'm able to deduct that, assuming my you know itemized deduction is large enough. To which I would say, yes, you can. Your, your taxable income won't be any different whether you do a traditional cash from your bank account donation or QCD, your taxable income will be the same. Your gross income will be different. Specifically, it'll be lower with a QCD. Why does that matter? Because there's other things, there's other taxes that key off of your adjusted gross income. For example, Medicare surcharges known as IRMA are based on your adjusted gross income. QCDs reduce your adjusted gross income as opposed to taking RMDs. Uh, writing cash donations out of your bank account do not. They do not reduce your adjusted gross income. They reduce your taxable income. That's the difference. Keep that in mind. And that's why I said, if you're over 70 and a half and have an IRA and make donations, uh, I will go so far as to say, all your donating should be done by way of, uh, all your cash donating should be done by way of QCDs. If you donate stuff like lamps and furniture, go ahead and do that anyway. 
you know, you can't uh, replace that with QCDs. Um, but if you're donating cash, QCD is the way to do it. No doubt. Okay. Um, that's QCDs. And finally, donating appreciated securities. Um, these are, so these would come out of your taxable brokerage account, not your IRA, you know, not a qualified account. Those don't qualify. You can't donate securities out of those. You can only donate cash, such as in the case of a QCD. But again, you have to be over 70 and a half. If you have a regular brokerage account, regardless of your age, you can, you can donate securities out of it. Why do this? Well, the benefit is let's assume you have a, a stock or a bond or a mutual fund you don't really want anymore. Um, and it has a lot of unrealized gain. You bought it really low decades ago. And now it's substantially higher in price. If you were to sell it, you're going to have a potentially large uh, tax bill on that gain, realizing that gain. Well, if you're charitably inclined and you don't really want the security, you can donate away the security. You can just simply give it to a charity. Um, in doing so, all of that unrealized gain is no longer yours. It, it gets you know tacked along with the security. It's now the uh, charity's unrealized gain to deal with, but charities don't pay taxes. So when they sell it, they will not have to pay any tax on that unrealized gain, whereas you would if you sold it when you owned it. So this is a way to kill a few birds at one stone again, meeting charitable, uh, you know, charitable desires, getting rid of a security you don't want, and offloading uh, the unrealized potential tax burden of that security to someone else, specifically a charity who's not going to have to pay taxes on it anyway. Everyone wins. Um, not all charities accept securities. Typically the smaller ones don't local church may not. The charity needs to be linked up with a broker or a brokerage account at least. So they have somewhere to receive in the securities. Uh, so you check first, if you plan on, uh, wanting to donate securities to your local charity, ask if they can even take securities. Don't be surprised if they say no, especially if they're a fairly small charity. And as we touched on earlier, beware of the deduction limits. On, on securities. If you're deducting capital gains, you know, things that are gain, long-term gain at fair market value, you can only deduct up to 30% of your AGI. Or if you're deducting at cost, you can deduct up to 50% of your AGI. All right. I think that's all I had. Yes, that's all I had. Okay. I'll take off my screen share. Um, I'll take questions now. I saw there what not a lot of people here, 33 people watching. Dave Myers all over the replies. Outside of that, pretty uh, pretty tame tonight. Um, so here's a question from before. Did parents taxes two years ago, she owed $6,000. I realized I should have filed her as head of household instead of single. After doing the change this year, she only owed 2,800 rounding to make it simple. Thank you. I asked for the refund in I bonds. I know a refund on taxes can buy I bonds, but unsure if a mistake for a refund qualifies. So that's a good question. Um, wow. I, I don't know. Excellent question. So yes, you're right that up to $5,000 of tax return refund can be used to buy I-bonds. Um, in this case, you're getting, what, $3,200 of refund. But I frankly don't know if you can use that 32 to buy I-bonds because like you said, it wasn't... Is it really a refund if you're just giving back money you overly paid because you inappropriately filed the first time? I don't know. The best I can say is when you're doing the tax return and whatever software you use and it says, okay, you have a $3,200 refund, see if there's an option in there to let you uh, divert, specifically it's form 8888, quadruple eight, that'll let you peel off some of the refund to buy I bonds. See if it'll let you do that. If it does, great, run with it, You know, go for it. If it doesn't, and blocks you out, then there might be your answer. The answer may be no, you, you can't do that in this case. Uh, great question. Alrighty, what other questions do you all have? If any, I'm scrolling down, scrolling down. I don't see any questions. Wow, this may be the fastest one ever. Um, so, okay, so I'll kill some time here for a moment. If anyone else has questions about whatever, feel free to dump them in. This is the last formally scheduled taxes and retirement. As I mentioned uh, a handful of weeks ago, um, we'll not be keeping up the, the weekly cadence of these things. I rounded out April because I'd already pre-announced the schedule through April. So here I am. But after today, uh, frankly, not entirely sure how, these, uh, how often these things will happen. Um, next week, I'll do a mailbag. My, my plan so far is to try to still do the first of each month, do a mailbag. 
And then um, I'll do probably at most one other live each month where I guess I'll mix it up between guests and other sort of special topics or current event relevant topics, or if anyone else has anything in particular you want to see, um, let me know. But uh, don't be shocked. Don't be surprised that you haven't seen the schedule announced for uh, these Facebook lives beyond this month because there is no schedule. It's kind of be a little more off the cuff going forward. So anyway, that's it. Um, oh, here's a question. Here's two questions. Perry asked. So yeah, good question. Um, when I did this, <laughs> when I when I did this presentation last year, I did have a fifth uh, a, a thing, a fifth tactic that was this. So for 2020 and 2021, these were one-off uh, pandemic relief initiatives. Again, even if you were to take, even if you were taking the standard deduction, you were still able to additionally deduct up to three hundred dollars in 2020, or six hundred in 2021, only if you're married filing joint, of uh, additional cash charitable donations. That stopped. You can't do that in 2022, Perry. So that, that ship has sailed. Um, not an option for this year. Who, uh, maybe they'll bring it back at some point. I don't know. But as of now, no. These extra uh, things do not um, uh, do not apply. Will donation increase audit risk? Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I frankly never found a source a definitive source that says what exactly does and doesn't increase audit risk and or by how much few things I've regularly been told by other people. I, I trust and respect their knowledge and taxes is if you're a small business owner that increases the chances. Um, if you have a lot of deductions, not necessarily donations, but deductions in general, that increases the chances. Uh, there's a few other things I'm drawing a blank on. I think high income, all else equal, um, might increase your chances. Outside of that, I don't know. So donating itself doesn't. If you have really large donations, I'm guessing yes, that would, uh, especially if it's non-cash donations. Like cash donations, all donations need to be substantiated. You need some sort of acknowledgement or receipt. There's different um, rules depending on the dollar amount. If it's up to 250 bucks, you just need some sort of contemporary contemporaneous acknowledgement. Like I think, uh, you know, typically get an email or something is fine. I, I, had, I had a whole other video on this. I, I forget, forget it's been a while, but if it's over like 500 bucks uh, and it's non-cash, you need to fill out, I forget the form number, but there's a form you have to attach it with your tax return. When you give more info, who'd you donate it to? What was your cost? What was its current value? Um, <clears throat> how long did you own it? What was it? <clears throat> you know, some, was it lamps? Was it a clothes? Was it a table? I don't know, whatever. So the more, the, the larger the donation is, the more backup and proof and info you need about it. So at some point, yes, I assume making really large donations increases audit risk. Definitely have your record square. Definitely do not fudge or round donations, especially if they're large. Uh, cause if, and when IRS comes knocking, you know, you'll have some issues if you can't substantiate all this stuff, but generally speaking, if the average person's given 5,000 bucks, 10,000 bucks a year, uh, I don't know. I don't believe it's going to raise any flags or at least raise any flags more likely than, it, than otherwise would have. Okay. Do you recommend most folks file form 706 after first spousal death? I know limits are high now, but but whatever that last word is. So I know where you're going with this. Um, you're talking about the uh, deceased spouse unused exemption or otherwise known as DSUE. So each person currently has roughly $12 million of unified credit, which means when you die, if you didn't already gift more than your annual exclusion amounts of 16,000 bucks a year per person throughout life, you can die with up to $12 million worth of stuff in your estate and not have to pay any federal estate tax. State of state tax may be different. Some states have estate taxes at much lower thresholds than 12,000 bucks or 12 million bucks. Federally, currently, it's $12 million per person is the estate tax is the estate size where there's no estate tax. Um, that's going to drop to roughly $6 million as of now in 2026, but that will adjust with inflation and always subject to legislative changes. So your question is when one spouse dies in order the deceased spouse can port over his or her unused $12 million um, uh, state size exemption to the living spouse such that the living spouse can have $24 million 
of a state size when he or she ultimately dies before federal state tax may be owed. Again, that'll cut in half in 2026. Um, in order to actually port over that unused uh, state tax exemption, state size exemption, you need to file a form 706 at the death of the first spouse. So your question is, do I recommend most folks file it after the first spouse dies? I mean, the proper answer is yes, can't hurt. I mean, there's gonna be a cost associated with it. Um, it's not the easiest of forms. It's not terribly difficult, but it's not the easiest of forms to do, even if you're just doing this porting over of a state tax exemption. Um, so is it worth it? I don't know. If practically speaking, you don't really have any chance of hitting the $12 million limit on your own, or even the $6 million limit, you know, after it reverts back down in, in a few years, I don't know that you have to, you know, it's a good hedge. It's a good bet to do it anyway, or have someone do it for you because why not? Uh, other, again, other than the cost and process and filing the form. But for vast majority of people, I don't think you're going to hit the estate uh, size limit. Now, who knows? 20 years ago, the estate size limit was only like two, two million bucks, if not even lower, I think, actually, um, early 2000s. If we get back to that, sure, a lot of people will hit that and they will be subject to estate tax. Then it's going to matter. So that would be a reason why you may want to do this form to port it over, because who knows what the future holds of tax legislation. But uh, Correctly speaking, for most people, probably not necessary, but can't hurt to do it. So that, that's my answer there. Do I understand correctly that if I gift an I bond to my husband, even though we already purchased 10,000 this year? Sort of. Um, if you each already purchased your own 10 grand, you can each buy the gift for each other now, but you can't actually deliver the gift to each other. The gifted I bond kind of needs to sit in your what's called the gift box within your treasury direct account. Only next year can you actually formally deliver it to your spouse. Again, as, again assuming your spouse didn't already buy that year's $10,000. So the gift does use up, when you formally deliver the gift, does use up that year's $10,000 amount. Um, so you can still buy the bond now as a gift. It, it will still start accruing interest now at the current interest rates, but you can't technically give it to the recipient until next year in your case or you know whatever year there's there's uh availability because the person didn't already buy his or her own ten thousand dollars for the year yes you are correct qcds currently only apply to iras including sep simple inherited iras not employer plans like 401ks 403bs there is pending legislation um i forget what it's called SSRA, Securing Strong Retirement, I don't, I don't even know at this point. Um, there is pending legislation that would make 401ks eligible to have QCDs done from them, and I believe 403bs as well. As of now, no, it's only IRAs. OMG, last one. Yes, uh, Teresa, uh, it is my last one. Thank you. So, yeah, it just sort of, I don't know, feel like it's kind of run its course. I knew when I started this two years ago that at some point, it will be tough to keep up this live schedule every week because these are live, you know, every Wednesday night at eight, here I am. Uh, other than, you know, this year, Cody started doing some. And I knew at some point that that would be a grind and uh, not really sustainable or not necessarily wanting to sustain it. Plus, I've also covered a, a lot of the stuff now. You know, I'm doing the same thing over. Not that I don't mind. I think this is all new to some people, at least. So people are still benefiting, but it just kind of, you know, the weekly cadence feels like it's a little, little much at this point for various reasons. So I'm just going to kind of dial it back and wing it and see, see how this thing plays out going forward. But I'm glad you enjoy these, Teresa. I know you've been on a lot and thank you very much. You are a uh, frequent and regular contributor. So very much appreciate your, uh, your help and contribution. So thank you. Some said don't go over 5% of AGI to be safe. I assume this is in reference to donations. Yeah. And, and if your tax returns are all square, there's no harm in getting audited. Audit isn't bad. Um, unless, you know, you can't support what you did or you intentionally did something wrong, then it's not good. Um, but it, if you're doing everything on the up and up, absolutely no harm. Don't let fear of getting audited or questioned stop you from ever doing something. Uh, you know, as long as it's within the bounds of what you're allowed to do within tax code, go ahead and do it. Just make sure it's all documented and substantiated. That's it. All right. Uh, David Myers, I assume this isn't the form 706. Absolutely. Even if no state taxes are due. Yeah, so the state exemption is going down. Still going to be quite large for the time being, but who knows if it ever gets dropped substantially like it was 20 years ago. It could be as low as a million, $2 million. Um, I don't think we'll get there, but who knows. 
if deductions are way out of whack with your income, that could be a flag. Yeah, that makes sense. If your income is 50,000 bucks, you know, you have $50,000 of W2 earnings and you're apparently donating, you know, uh, 25 grand in cash every year that I, I would hope that would raise a flag actually. Not to say you can't, um, just they're going to want to know where are you getting this money from? If you're only making 50 grand, right? Where's this money coming from? Unless you got some massive like inherited account that you got, you know, 5 million bucks or something or not even whatever, a million bucks from a relative, different story. But yeah, th this would make sense. <clears throat> and what else we got here? Is mailbag going away too? No, th that's the one thing I will keep up just simply because it's kind of easy for me. to. I just show up and talk. I don't have to really prep anything. Um, like I said, I do plan on doing a mailbag the first of every month, but you know, all subject to change based on scheduling and you know what else I have going on that, that week. Uh, what are the chances on the ten thousand dollar limit on state and local tax deduction getting raised? I uh, don't know. Well, I take that back. So I believe it got capped as part of the the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that went into effect in twenty eighteen. Uh, prior to that, there, there wasn't a cap on it. Now, indirectly, there was because people who had large state and local deductions often got hit with the AMT, alternative minimum tax, which took away some of the benefit of those deductions. But now, now that we're in the Tax Cut and Jobs Act revisions, there is a $10,000 cap. I think I could be wrong, but I think when the Tax Cut and Jobs Act expires in 2026, the cap goes away with it. And we, we revert back to the, uh, the rules and provisions we had uh, in 2017. So I think it's already going away then. There has been buzz and talk throughout the year, the last few years, about getting the cap repealed or at least raised. Specifically, and this one's been interesting, specifically by the high tax states, many of which are not making this political, but Democratic. California, New York, New Jersey. Constituents in those states are the ones most hit by this state and local tax cap of 10 grand. So they've been, you know, constituents in these people in these states have been lobbying their legislators to, hey, get this cap raised. Um, but now that puts democratic legislators in a bind because typically democratic legislators aren't the ones to, uh, rate or, or, uh, you know, lower taxes or make tax provisions more favorable for high earners. So now to be fair, you don't have to be a high earner to be hit with this thing. Like I said, in New Jersey, it's quite easy to hit 10,000 bucks just in property taxes alone. So this affects a lot of people, but anyway, uh, I, I don't know. It's supposed to change in 2026. Maybe it'll change sooner. Like all tax legislation, this can all change every two years when there's either midterm elections or presidential elections. So don't be surprised if uh, political power um, changes this fall with the midterm elections coming up. And who knows what's going to happen to tax legislation after that. Ooh, Tips if I want to self-study for a CFP just to learn more if you're going away. Um, great question. So I actually did a fully self-study program when I did the education curriculum for CFP. I did it uh, through the American College of Financial Services. It's all self-study, all six courses. And then the seventh module is the uh, capstone financial plan uh, development process. I thought it was great. I'm, I'm, I'm good at self-studying. I'm fine at you know being motivated and making time for myself to study. If you're not, if you need the regimented structure of a classroom or even a virtual classroom, don't do self-study. But um, anyway, the program there at American College of Financial Services, I thought was really good for self-study. You do get physical books, which I like. I'm, I'm kind of old school when it comes to reading. And you get them accessible online if you want to read them online. So uh, that, that's what I did. <clears throat> uh, yep, Dave Myers confirmed the assault cap expires after 2025, as does the stand, right, standard deduction goes back. It'll get cut in half because standard deduction was doubled as part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Alrighty, that's it. Here we are. Uh, it's been we're coming up on the hour. Thank you all for joining um, the last regularly scheduled uh, tax and retirement. Hopefully you've all found these thoroughly invigorating. It's almost, I started doing these June, 2020. Didn't quite hit two years of doing it, but uh, close enough. Plenty happy with how they've gone. So. so that's it. Thank you all. I will see you most likely next week, which will be a mailbag episode. Take care.